Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Eternum Labs podcast. Today we have a very special guest on our show, Dr. Anthony G. J. He is one of the world's leading researchers in stem cell therapy, DNA consulting, and epigenetics. He is an author and you can find all of the links to his books and his website in the descriptions below. And before we start this podcast, I just want to let you guys know that we discuss in this podcast a lot about lion's mane mushroom, the benefits that it has for your cognition and your brain and high performance, and also for your immune system and your gut health and how that directly is responsible for creating serotonin in your brain and improving your mood and making you feel better. So it's like, it's it's got so many benefits in there. And if you would like to get some of that mushroom as we sell lion's mane mushroom and we sell a really good quality extract of the lion's mane and you can get 10% off of that lion's mane if you type in the code Corey with an E. So without any further ado, guys, love, I am so excited to share with you this podcast. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did and we will see you in the next one. G'day, Anthony. Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Corey. That's all right. So what have you been working on recently? What projects and like what's oh, been taking up your attention? <laughs> well, a lot of stuff. I mean... <laughs> Mostly I do DNA consulting. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's really been taking a lot of time because it impacts people's health in a really Mm -hmm. meaningful way. So I've been shifting away from research. I've been doing research for the past 15 plus years. But, you know, when I look at people's DNA, generally with 23andMe, um, you know, you can look at these risk genes and find these hidden issues that people have or prevent issues from happening. And that's a lot more important to me, you know, just Mm -hmm. in terms of having conversations with people rather than sitting in a lab all by myself, (laughs) uh, (laughs) working on stem cells or whatever. I've been doing a lot of interesting things over the years, but the DNA consulting has actually been one of my main projects recently. What does that look like? Yeah, people spit in the tube and they do the 23andMe yep. test. And then I actually have my own software. I've written my own software for this because 23andMe's report is such garbage. It's so meaningless. I've, I basically never have somebody who's thrilled about their 23andMe health report. And it costs like 100 bucks. <laughs> so it's like you get $100 for the test and then you add another $100. It's optional, but you can add another $100 for the their report and then they tell you your eyes are green you know what i mean it's like well i already know that and so i try and get a lot deeper like last week i had a guy from the military he had ptsd uh really bad like he was 38 years old he's waking up at night screaming messing up his family life and he had an oxytocin receptor gene issue that's kind of unusual kind of rare and you can do a lot to up your oxytocin you know, natural ways. You can also inject oxytocin. There's a guy named Howard Bloom. He used to be Billy Joel's producer, uh, music, you know, musical producer, like Styx and Billy Joel and all these big rock bands. And he was bedridden for like several years. And then he started injecting oxytocin and snapped right out of it. He's been on Joe Rogan's podcast talking about it. Yeah. So like this guy had that same gene issue where he had this oxytocin receptor issue most people don't have that. You know what I mean? I had another guy with, you know, a bunch of heart disease risk that was super, super high and it's a ticking time bomb. And of course the doctors are only focused on cholesterol, but you know, this gene is called factor five and it just makes your blood thicker. So then you work on thinning your blood and testing your blood and making sure it's not too thick all the time. You know, little things like that, like heart disease is an important one. Alzheimer's is important to prevent rather than wait until you get it on and on. I mean, I look at diet, I look at vitamins, hormones, uh, sleep genes, training genes, your workout genes. Are you fast twitch? Are you slow twitch? What about your joints? You know, how can we keep those dialed in and instead of, you know, falling apart with age, all kinds of stuff. So I try and be really holistic because sometimes your, your body's ability to process vitamins is the most important thing for your sleep. And sometimes it's what? specific genes that are involved. In, well, yeah, like 5-MTHF, you know, you're familiar with methylfolate, right? Yeah. Like these MTHFR genes that a lot of people talk about. Um, 
in America. I'm so happy I don't have any. <laughs> oh, yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, thank God. Yeah. Well, and there's different degrees of them, too. Some of them are really bad and some of them are less bad. But a lot of people, when they have the less bad versions, they kind of just put themselves in the MTHFR camp and say, oh, I've got the MTHFR, as if there's like, it's all just one group, you know? But there's different gr gradients of how bad those can be. But you you can look on the Amazon reviews at those supplements. It's called 5-MTHF. That's the supplement. It's just another way of saying methylfolate. But if you search Amazon 5-MTHF and you look at that vitamin, you'll see thousands of reviews of people saying, this completely transformed my sleep. And it's not, you know, it's a vitamin issue. It's a it's your body's, you know, processing a vitamin differently than other people. So it's not like a specific sleep gene, like the clock gene. There's literally a gene called clock. It's like a circadian regulator gene. You can have issues with that gene and, and it disrupts your sleep. You can have issues with blue light sensitivity and that disrupts. That's very direct in terms of how your genetics impact your sleep. But wow. vitamins, hormones, right? Like people have low testosterone, they bump it up and they immediately sleep better, right? So that's a hormone related genetic issue oftentimes that translates to sleep. So you have to look at it holistically. And that's what I try and do is instead of saying, well, let's just do sleep genes because you have an issue with sleep, right? <laughs> yeah. Because that wouldn't really fix the problem sometimes, most of the time. So out of curiosity, what are like some of the common things that you see that obviously, because you have the DNA report, you'd be able to look at the DNA report and say, it's right here. Yep. Uh, is there anything common stuff that you see that you're like, oh, that's a symptom that that person has that shows up in the DNA report. And then we'd help them with this, with a testosterone, or we'd help this for a sleep. And then it would have a result. I'm just thinking in terms of anyone who was listening, mm -hmm. who was like, well, I haven't got a DNA report, but what's like a common symptom that come up that maybe if I tried something could yeah. be beneficial. Oh, it's so variable. That's why it's interesting. <laughs> oh, a, yeah. a, a popular, like a really common symptom that, I, that people send me an email and say, hey, I've got anxiety. That's a really common issue, especially in America. Our food is such garbage. I mean, it's not much different over there, but um, people have anxiety and literally, I think 25% of Americans, <clears throat> excuse me, 25% of Americans are on Prozac. Uh, or Lexapro or Zoloft, like these drugs. There's a class of drugs called SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And doctors are trying to increase people's serotonin in their brain with these drugs. And, you know, if you, so if you go into the doctor and you say, hey, I've got anxiety, I've got depression, that's what they do. They say, oh, let me get you some Prozac. And the problem is they're fake drugs, right? They're patented, they're made in the lab, they're not found in nature, they have side effects. You oftentimes get dependent on them. Uh, they stop working after a while, oftentimes. It's not ideal. And uh, what's really, really interesting, a lot of people, I mean, like 40% of people have genetic issues dealing with serotonin, like basically pumping it up into their brain. And that's why it's so common to have anxiety and depression. But the root cause is your gut you know, like your, your intestines, your, your bowels, basically, because 95% of serotonin is made in the gut. So if people fix their gut, generally, even if they have those genetic risks, there's no issue. But if they have those genetic issues and they're eating junk food or their guts messed up, like they're eating foods that they're sensitive to, like sometimes it's dairy, sometimes it's gluten, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, whatever. It varies. That's another one. Look at the genes, right? It varies. But if people have gut issues, that's the real cause of the anxiety, but people don't put that, even professional doctors don't put that together because like, well, the gut's down here, the brain's up here, <laughs> but let's just give people drugs that modulate things in their brain, you know, but it doesn't actually translate very well doing it that way, because at the end of the day, you still have a gut problem. Now you've got a drug that you're dependent on that's causing side effects and you still have a gut problem. And eventually that leads to joint issues or some other kind of problem. You know what I mean? <clears throat> So, and it yeah. shows up somewhere. What would you mm -hmm. usually generally prescribe people to do? Because as I was thinking, like, obviously there's a bunch of subs and, and things you could take. But the first thing that popped to my was like, well, you could go for a run. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get some serotonin, you go for a run, you feel back, go come back and feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Exercise is huge. 
I mean, you know, speaking of supplements, I know you've got a lion's mane supplement yep. and, uh, mushrooms, they actually have a vitamin. It's called ergothionine and nobody talks about it. It's super interesting. E R G O ergo. And then thionine. I don't even want to try and spell that. But, <laughs> and the, and it's a vitamin meaning like your body can't produce it, but you need it from your diet or a supplement. And the reason I bring it up is because it's good for your gut. It's really helpful for your gut to protect your gut lining. And plants have a little bit of ergothionine, but mushrooms have like a thousand times more ergothionine. So it's what? kind of like a side benefit of lion's mane and other mushrooms. Lion's mane obviously has that cognitive enhancement. It boosts your brain performance. But then a side effect, if you want to call it that, is it actually helps your gut lining also. And some people literally have genetic issues processing ergothionine, like they need more than most people. So mushrooms are way more beneficial for those people. Just as like a random example, you know, tying in a supplement with the gut that, you know, is, is something nobody talks about. If, if ergothionine was called vitamin X, everybody would talk about it because <laughs> it'd be sexy. It'd be interesting. The fact that it's yeah. called ergothionine. You look at the word and the way it's spelled out, nobody even wants to try and pronounce it. It's not, you know, to ask your doctor, I guarantee you, he's probably never heard of it, you know? That is insane. It actually makes so much sense because I've been eating a lot of mushrooms recently. Mm -hmm. I've changed up my diet and I've just, I've experimented because I was getting gassy eating other vegetables. Mm -hmm. I changed up to like, well, if I eat a different variety of mushrooms, mm -hmm. I should be able to get a lot more of those nutrients. Right. And I'm feeling great. I haven't gotten sick like yeah, yeah, yeah. at all. And I'm like, I've been just feeling like my mood's been great. So that, thank you for saying that because that's made yeah. so much sense. It's, it's interesting and nobody talks about it. And people, they almost pretend like, I mean, you don't because you, you've got a lion's mane supplement, you know, that you're behind. But a lot of people out there in the nutrition world, they're kind of like, ah, oh, mushrooms, it's just fiber. <laughs> Like as if that's the only thing they're good for. It's like, oh, it's a little bit of fiber and otherwise it's just water or something. Yeah. And it's crazy. Fiber, vitamin D is about it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they're vitamin D. But yeah, it's it goes beyond that with mushrooms. They're an interesting organism. <clears throat> what else do you know about them? What else do you found oh, that's geez. been beneficial? Not that much, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of my knowledge uh, comes from basically digging into these genetic issues that come up. And since I've been doing it for more than 10 years, I've seen a lot of weird ones. And then you get down these rabbit holes of, you know, somebody's not processing erythionine or they're not taking it up. How do we get erythionine? And then suddenly I'm researching mushrooms. So it usually starts with like a genetic issue. And then it snowballs into me figuring out, you know, approaches that are natural, that are just foods or exercise, like you said, or intermittent fasting or whatever that can fix that problem rather than trying to use drugs every once in a while you have to use a drug i get it right you get a blood pressure gene or something and you've tried everything your body weight's amazing you know yeah you don't want to be walking around with high blood pressure all the time usually there's natural ways though yeah for sure tell us about a time where you had like a, a big success maybe with someone it was like mm. a little bit difficult and it was like you know you had to like really flex some of your knowledge and get down and good into the research and then you were like Oh, that was worth it. Dude, to j just today, I had a woman who had two plus plus genes, meaning like really bad genes uh, for bilirubin buildup. And bilirubin, again, not a lot of people talk about it. Not a lot of doctors checking it on your blood test, which is why it was such a huge win today because uh, this woman was 44, I think. And she had these two genes. So, you know, she's, she's basically prone to having really high bilirubin and the problem with that number one she's low carb and she's very successful with low carb meaning like if she eats a bunch of carbs she gains weight she gets obese all this you know gets tired so she's doing great low carb but what do you eat if you're low carb fats and proteins right probably pretty high fat diet and this bilirubin gene that she's got or these two actually they cause bilirubin to build up. And eventually what that oftentimes does is it causes gallstones. So you actually get physical stones in your gallbladder. And the only way to deal with that, doctors do surgery and they remove the gallbladder. 
which sounds kind of trivial because it's like, well, we never even heard of the gallbladder. So why is it important? Let's just cut it out. But what that does is it basically means like you can't eat fats without taking drugs. Like basically the gallbladder is important for making bile, which helps your body process fats when you eat them. So now suddenly you, you have to start eating carbs or you've got to take drugs to deal with this, you know, like replace bile and all this. It's much, much better to find these genes and say, look, you're going to be disposed to high bilirubin. There's two things you got to do or just maybe one. The first thing and the most important is to get out in the sunshine, get your skin in the sunshine because sunshine breaks down bilirubin. And that's why newborn babies, if you get one of those babies that doesn't, that it has jaundice, they're super yellow colored. They literally put them in a UV light. Um, Happened to me. Oh yeah. Right on. You probably had the billy room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, hopefully you don't have a couple of them, but uh, get out in the sun. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, so, yeah. good place to get out in the sun. Mm-hmm. And it, the reason I say it's such a big win is because this woman still has her gallbladder. And I can't tell you how many clients I've had that. I've talked to that have the exact same lineup of bilirubin genes. And I tell them like, shoot, like gallstones probably run in your family. You've got to get out in the sun, break down that. And they're like, oh yeah, I had, I forgot to tell you my gallbladder. I've had my gallbladder removed and it'll be like 50 years old. And it's such a bummer because like, man, I wish I had talked to you like six months ago. <laughs> I wish I had talked to you five years ago or whatever, because it's so preventable. Sunshine, that's the big one. Again, that's if you're out enough, that's all you need. But if you're not out enough or if it's winter time, sometimes you need a little assistance and a baby aspirin every day can actually also help you clear bilirubin. So generally I'm not a fan of taking baby aspirin all the time. Um, but in that rare situation, you know, I am a fan or some other salicylate, like there's salicylates in, uh, a lot of different foods, you know, like I'm blanking on some of the specific ones, but if you just Google like salicylate, rich foods, what uh, are salicylates? Sal- salicylates are just compounds that are found in plants that are just involved in like plant signaling and plant chemical processing. But like, we don't have them naturally. Like if you cut open your muscle and look for salicylates, you're not going to find them. You know what I mean? Like it's like fiber, like plants have all this weird stuff. If you cut open your arm and you look at your muscle, you're not going to find fiber either. So anybody who says like fiber is a necessary nutrient, it's not really, you know, it's not really true, but it has beneficial properties in a lot of ways. And same with salicylates, but you can get people that are literally sensitive to salicylates and they're bad for them. So it's kind of a complicated thing, but in terms of clearing bilirubin, it helps. So, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a long story, but. um, Learning some new words today. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's. (laughs) Well, let me think. I mean, there's other simple, you know, there's a lot of people that have dairy sensitivities and most of the time it comes up on the DNA report. I'll tell them, look, you've got a really severe dairy sensitivity based on your genetics. And they'll say, oh, of course, like I know that I never touch dairy. If I do, I get bloated. I feel gas, whatever, all this stuff. It hurts. But sometimes I do catch people that have those dairy sensitivities. And they're like, no, I don't think I have dairy sensitivity. And it's like, you got to cut dairy. And then it's like, that explains your anxiety. That explains your, your lack of testosterone sometimes, right? Like if you have inflammation and you're doing something that's causing inflammation that you don't even know, you might have amazing sleep. You know, you might have all these things and you think your testosterone should be nice and high. You should be putting on muscle. You should be super motivated, super energetic, and you're not. And if you're in a state of chronic inflammation, that's going to suppress that testosterone and really put you up against a wall in terms of motivation and energy and all this and inflammation is fight or flight right like when you're running away from a tiger you're in a state of you're you're in a breakdown state you're not building muscle (laughs) when you're in an emergency state you're breaking stuff down you know what i mean so if you're doing that without even realizing what the root cause is you know that's a win as far as i'm concerned like that's that's a good day. We find those genes. <laughs> we know, like oh, we identify sure. something that somebody doesn't know. Cause that's the goal, right? Like if you already knew all your health risks, you know, no need to look at your genetics. And sometimes too, like if people are going into surgery or if they need a prescription drug or something, there's a lot of genetic differences between people and how they process prescription drugs. And I actually don't even look at that stuff because I'm not generally a fan of, you know, like going that route. 
but obviously sometimes you have to. And there's even good services out there that exist just looking at how your body deals with anesthesia or something like that. Like some people need a lot more anesthesia. Their body breaks down really quick. Some people get super sick from that and they need a lot less. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about in terms of how DNA would affect with certain prescription medicines and stuff like that. It's Another dramatic, thing that yeah. I think cra is crazy. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. But obviously we're in ingesting it. Of course, we're all going to mm -hmm. have different different effects to it. But what I find also is you know, the, just the sheer importance of getting your DNA like tested is, well, you don't really know what you don't know unless you mm. believe it. And there's a lot of people that are on one side of the fence. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But then I, I talk to them. They're like, oh, but this hurts. And like, mm. I can't lose weight. And oh, mm -hmm. I'm so tired all the time. Or my anxiety gets to me. Or I feel bloated whenever I eat this. Or yeah. And, and all these different symptoms, and it's so hard. To, a lot of people sometimes will say, "Like, this is like solve a problem." You could should, maybe I'd I'd encourage you to get a DNA test. Yeah. To yeah. To, to see to see all of these things, but it's like difficult to sometimes get people to to invest in them. Yeah, even doctors, right? I mean, unfortunately, the modern medical system isn't even tapping into that. Even in the case of anesthesia, or something that's like super obvious, where it's like a hundred dollar test you know, maybe even cheaper if you're doing it in house at your own clinic or something instead of using 23andMe, but it's, it's so cheap. And the information like 23andMe, they do 650,000 snips. So it's like <laughs> thousands of pages of data. It's not like a trivial data set that just tells you which countries you're from. And it's, it's cool. Like I sometimes do families and you know, if, so just as a little bit of backdrop here, we actually have, two copies of dna in every cell in our body most people don't realize that um so we have like a redundancy which is kind of cool there but the reason i bring that up is because the only cells that don't have two copies are egg and sperm cells they only have one copy of dna and then of course when egg and sperm cells fuse together that's where you got the copy of dna from your mother and the copy from your father but when you look at genetics you can you, you can define like a bad gene from one parent as a plus you know what I mean? Like I, I use the word plus, like I, I use the plus symbol. A lot of scientists do to, to mean like, yeah, you're positive for a bad gene, right? So like if you've got two plus pluses, that means you got a bad gene from your mother and a bad gene from your father. Whereas if you've got a plus minus, that means you got a bad gene from one parent and a good gene from the other parent. A little complicated, I, I know, but um, so um, <laughs> what's cool when you do genetic analysis with families, if both parents have plus plus genes, all the kids will have plus plus on that same gene right so it's very it's the technology is super pure you know like but what's really interesting is if if both parents have a plus minus right then some kids get the plus some kids get like plus plus some kids get minus minus some kids get plus minus so you get like this whole range of health risks in the kids and then, of course, if the parents are minus minus on both genes, all the kids have a minus minus. So it's really predictive. It's really interesting to see when parents have plus plus, all the kids get those plus plus genes, you know. So it, it's it's super accurate. Like the FDA approved it in, in America because it's over 99.99% reproducible and your DNA doesn't change. It's not like two years from now, if you spit in that tube, you're going to get a different result. It's the exact same thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I find that just it's, it's just insane that we have access to that and we can yeah. and we can look at it and we can make and make decisions like it wasn't until I just got like a DNA fit test done yeah and just got like generalized everything and I, I dove down to the research for a while mm -hmm. and I did look at all the, the the plus minus stuff and I understand it was two copies of the genes but I didn't know it was one from mum and one from dad so oh yeah thank you for for clarifying that yeah. and um oh it's just so fantastic to look at with with it just it seems like you're so unconscious about things that you do. It's like, oh yeah, I can eat dairy. I can I've got a low celiac predisposition, and like, um, I'm I'm really sensitive towards the caffeine. And mm -hmm. just looking at it, I was like, I am really sensitive towards caffeine. I'm not going to drink caffeine after 10 a.m. anymore, and I'm probably only going to have three coffees a week. I feel fantastic mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, yeah, it <laughs> makes a difference. Some people have anxiety risk from caffeine. Whoa. Like irrespective of their serotonin, they have genetic risk for anxiety. Um, 
just from caffeine, in which case it doesn't mean you can't have it. Like I have, I have some of those genes and I try and channel it. Like I get the anxiety from it and I just use it to do taxes or paperwork or stuff I don't like to do. <laughs> but you know, I, I at least recognize that I've got that risk. So if I'm giving a talk, right, if I'm public speaking or something, I definitely don't do caffeine because it's, it just amplifies more nervousness, anxiety. And so you would be, the tendency would, would be to think, I need my brain functioning at a high level. Let's drink a bunch of coffee and then go out on stage. But it totally does the opposite for me. It just makes me much more nervous and anxious and it's counterproductive. So things like that are good to know because knowledge is power, right? Like if you don't know that, you can't tap into it. And that's just true across the board with these genetic issues. Is like some people would rather not know because they feel like, you know, oh, it's scary. It's, it's going to be, be yeah, it's going to scare me. It's going to be too, whatever. But there's almost always a solution. I mean, there is, there's always a solution, you know, like you hear about these rare genes that 0.0001% of the population has or whatever, but they're so rare. They're mutations. They're not something that our ancestors have kind of developed through our, our genetics. Like a lot of our genes are really simple, intermittent fast. Our ancestors were doing it. Almost everybody has intermittent fasting genes because for thousands of years, food wasn't readily available. It's not like you just woke up and popped open your fridge and had breakfast. You know what I mean? And so, like, it's pretty clear if you look at DNA that that's what's going on. Have you ever seen the TV show Alone? No, I haven't. Oh, it's cool, man. You should watch it. Um, it's like the only show I actually pay for <laughs> on Amazon. <laughs> but it's it's basically... It's an American show, and they drop people into the wilderness that are supposedly survival experts, and they give them some tools. It's not like, you know, naked and afraid type of thing. It's it's legit. They give them tarp and the tools. They give them, like, a few items they, they get to choose from this list, and there's about 10 contestants, and basically, they just let them survive on their own, and they give them camera gear, and they replace their batteries once a week, but otherwise, they're totally isolated, totally alone, and they're surviving, and there's two things that are really obvious about the show. One of them is that nobody's vegan. You know what I mean? Like, how people come on the show as vegans, like, oh, I love plants. I'm eating all the plants. And then, like, two weeks later, they're like, where's the meat? <laughs> because they're starving out there. The other thing is, like, everybody's fasting. They're always fasting. It's like, oh, I shot a deer. I ate the deer over the course of the month. I'm back to fasting. They're rationing food all the time. They're juggling between intermittent fasting and day long fast, multi day fast. It's just what our ancestors did, I think, you know? Dude, it's so true. I um coach my dad because I coach I recommend it well, I encourage a lot of people and coach them doing a bit of fasting. But one of the best transformations was actually my dad. Mm -hmm. And he was just super inflamed. And I was like, Well, someone who's like starting to approach sixty, I'm like, Dad, you should just just get really good at one thing because you're struggling with eating or whatever it is try doing a three day, like build up mm. to doing a three day fast. Very good. He did eight, three day fast back to back wow. every single week. And wow. he ended up losing, I think it was like 15, 16 kilos. Yeah. He looked fantastic. And he's like, I've never felt better in my entire life. Yep. And those three days, every time I did one, it got better and better wow. and better wow. to the point where I was just like, like he was so alert yeah. and so switched on. And now he does like a three day fast whenever he just starts to get a bit depressed. Yeah. He does a yeah. three day fast. That's he's funny. like, I feel fantastic again. It's funny you say that because that's how I really kicked off my my health journey. I did a three day fast. Um I've had I had allergies for like most of my life to pollen. And they were bad. Like I would get bloodshot eyes, they were all itchy. I wanted to just rip out my eyes. I mean it was bad. It was worse than anybody that I knew in terms of just how bad my eyes got. And I did a three-day fast. No joke. I've never had allergies since. I did a water-only fast. They, my allergy, It was right before allergy season. And I was already starting to get them a little bit. And then they stopped after, around that in the middle of that fast. And they never came back. <laughs> it It's good for your immune system. Clearly, it did something to like reprogram my immune system. It's good for your stem cells. It's just, again, it's in line with the ancestors. You know, some people, they probably had tribes you know, for thousands of years that were in some region of some country 
where the water was super pure, didn't have any heavy metals, they had no exposure to heavy metals. So why would they have amazing heavy metal clearance genes, right? Like their genes don't need to clear heavy metals. Their, their ancestors never had a lot of heavy metal exposure. So then they come into these modern societies where we have some heavy metals, right? We're, you know, we're eating fish that have mercury or whatever the thing is. Now they've got poor genes for clearing heavy metals. Suddenly it's a problem, right? Or other tribes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some tribes had, they didn't have to worry about bilirubin because they lived out in the sunshine. Now we're sitting in a cubicle, we're indoors. You see those genes, boom, you've got to either get out in the sun, use a tanning bed. And by the way, I heard that tanning beds are illegal in Australia. Is that true? They are. They ah, are so illegal. Yeah, it's true. You have, to, you have to know someone who's got one in their house that has like a three-phase plug-in. Oh, my gosh. To, to use them. I actually saw on your website, you had like a, it was like a vitamin D. UV lamp. UV lamp. Right. I saw that on your website. I didn't even know they were legit. Like, I know about juves. Oh, I yeah. didn't know there was vitamin D lamps. And like, I've got the genes. I need more vitamin yeah, D. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. my goodness yeah they're expensive though i always tell people just fly just get a flight and like go to florida or something <laughs> but yeah they, just move I mean, somewhere sunnier. i've got one i mean here whoops let's see if i can do this without unplugging all my it's this here yeah it's a beast it's uv yeah look at that <laughs> yeah you got, like, got the goggles crazy. on it you know what i mean like oh nice yeah because it'll, fr- it'll fry your eyes um because it's actual uv but it does bump up your levels and it is at home i can do it just sitting here in my in my chair you know (laughs) yeah but it's 600 bucks i mean it's not it's not cheap but uh, you Uh, know in america i was tanning beds are illegal so (laughs) that's that's an interesting problem yeah and also i was gonna say over here it's like ten dollars a month for a membership at a tanning bed so you can just go there for three times a week if you've got issues like these um, obviously you don't want to get sunburned and that's true of the vitamin D lamp too. You can get legit sunburn from that. My wife's done it once. Um, and that's the opposite of good health, right? Like sunburn is literally inflammation. <laughs> yeah. so that's kind of so obvious, I, but you got to say the obvious thing sometimes because people are like, you know, like they're going to overdo it. And then the doctors yeah. are going to blame the vitamin D lamp for bad health instead of good health. If you're using it in the proper way. Oh, so true. Like if I went on a bench press and I tried to bench press 200 kilos, I'd crush myself. So Yeah, you'd rip your shoulders out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah 100%. So um, how, how do you specifically, so I'd like to talk about, move like the topic conversation on to like optimizing yourself mm. in terms of what to learn, what to take, what to do, because you're constantly researching. You've done all the <laughs> crazy research and, and you're helping people. How do you think? What well, uh, first? Firstly, I just like to understand how do you optimize yourself, and what are the things that like you wouldn't not ever do? Like things that you put boundary around, it's like no, I protect these. I'm gonna make mm. sure that I do these like sure. religiously. Well, starting with breakfast, I skip breakfast religiously. Like I have since I was five years old, so I'm kind of an outlier in that regard, and. And when I was a kid, I only did it because I'm gluten sensitive and my parents, all they had was cereal and it hurt my stomach and I just stopped doing it. And then I kept eating gluten for lunch and things like that because I didn't know any better. And that's what food is around here. But, you know, about 15 years ago, I discovered that I'm gluten sensitive because my daughter was and she had diarrhea for, like as a newborn for literally one year. And, and the doctors were testing, testing her and saying everything's fine. And I'm saying, no, not everything's fine. She's got freaking diarrhea and then i caught a bunch of different things from her diet it basically did an elimination found she's sensitive to gluten i did the same elimination found i'm super sensitive to gluten it physically hurts when i have it and it was crazy because i was eating it all the time and i had acid reflux i had hemorrhoids i had all these health problems that went away when i cut that um but i carried on skipping breakfast and i've done breakfast here and there over the years not recently but you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, trying to bulk up or whatever the goal was at the time. And it, you feel crappy, you have less energy. So for me, that's one thing I definitely do. I, I, uh, I also eat pretty keto lunch. I don't eat carbs for lunch. So for dinner, I definitely eat carbs, but for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty high fat to be honest. And, and sometimes high protein for lunch. Uh, 
in terms of sleep, I love tracking my sleep with the Aura Ring. I've learned a lot about my individual issues, and I'm wearing it right now because it's, you know, we're on a different time zone here. It's literally midnight right now. <laughs> um, <God>. Yeah. <laughs> but, but generally, I've struggled with sleep historically, uh, and this thing has helped a lot in terms of figuring out how bad snacking in the evening. I never snack in the evening because that's another one that just ruins your sleep. And I didn't realize it was so bad until I started tracking my sleep. I use a chili pad when I sleep at night. It keeps my bed cool. Um, that's really bumped up my sleep, keeping my room pitch, pitch black. I even travel with blackout curtains. You know, if I go to hotels and stuff, I've got these ones with su suction cups on them. Um, what? Yeah, they're great. Uh, it just pitch black. And then I throw, like, pillows at the door and stuff to make sure there's not, a, like, a light <laughs> crack under the door. And <laughs> Turn off all the lights and kind of look around and say, oh, there's a like, little light coming from over there. Let me throw something on that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty obsessive, but, um, you know, like that, that's really, it's just me, right? Like I'm just a poor sleeper. Um, training, I definitely lift weights. I go way out of my way. Like when I travel to give talks at conferences, I actually have a membership at Planet Fitness, which is a national or in america it's it's all around the country and uh you know that way when i go traveling pretty much anywhere i can find one of those gyms and then i can actually lift some weights and i i make an effort to do that um i don't really do meditation but i do breath holds i do free diving and that's a form of meditation i use apps on my phone there's one called stamina it's a sleep it's an apnea trainer so you can actually do like co2 and o2 tables they're called ap apnea tables a p n e a and you literally just br doing breath holds in repetitions it's almost like going to the gym so what you do is like hold your breath for a minute and then you breathe for a minute and then you hold your breath for a minute and you breathe for 50 seconds and then you hold your breath for a minute and breathe for 40 seconds and you on and on like you do this progression and that teaches your body to handle co2 better or oxygen better um and I'm just using a minute as an example. You can set the amount of times different for your 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 goals or where you're at in terms of how much you can hold your breath. And I like spearfishing too, so that it's a win-win, right? Because you can dive down and spearfish. Yeah. And I'm pretty much a newbie at that. I'm super new to it, but I love it. Um, so then I feel like I'm doing something, right? I'm doing breath holds, but it's with the goal of going underwater and shooting fish so I can hold my breath longer. But it's also a super phenomenal way to meditate. Because you can really slow your heart rate down and you can really calm your blood pressure down just by doing these breath holds and these free diving trainer training apps. Um, Is that how you caught some mahi mahi? Did you catch mahi mahi? Oh, yeah. Did you buy some? Yeah. No, yeah. I oh, I'm much. so jealous. <laughs> I went to, um, went to Bali and I was oh, looking yeah. for a barramundi substitute for, mm -hmm. for eating. And I looked and they had like this fish called Mahi Mahi and it come up at a few restaurants. And I was like, what is this? And I, so looked good. At like, I Googled it and looked at all the stats. I was like, this is a really good quality fish. Yeah. When I got it and ordered it and tasted it, I was like, this tastes incredible. It's amazing. When I saw on your Instagram, I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I wish I could get Mahi Mahi here. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. We caught 30 of them down in the Keys. Um, Whoa. Weeks, which was our limit. You know, we could only keep 10 per person and it was me and my brother and the captain of the boat. So we had 30 and, uh, I actually am going to go spearfish for him next time. So this time we were fishing rod and reel and that was wild. And I'm, I, I mean, I have like so much meat. It's ridiculous. It, like at my Airbnb, the place I was staying, the refrigerator or the freezer was literally, it's just one of those, like, it wasn't a mini freezer. It's a normal stand-up freezer, but the whole entire freezer was filled with meat, like completely. And we, I caught a group or two that on that same day that was, I think 40 or 50 pounds and the flay was you know, like ridiculous. It's so big and heavy. So I like stacking up on fish meat like that, especially when it's really good. But yeah, man, fishing, spear diving. I mean, I like getting outdoors, you know, and I think people should, it really resets your circadian rhythm and your, your, uh, your gut bacteria, you're breathing in all that dirt and it's healthy. It's a different mindset. You can't be stressed out when you're shooting fish underwater. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, what, I mean, in terms of optimization, I'm always tinkering too. I do a lot of tinkering, you know, so supplements and infrared lights and saunas and 
all that kind of stuff. The sauna, I'm a huge fan of a sauna also, but you know. Do you take vitamins when you go to the sauna? Because I fig- I found out myself personally, I have to take vitamins, otherwise I get like heat stroke. It's too hot. Yeah, I take electrolytes. That's the only one I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, some people do this niacin. You can do like a niacin protocol where you take vitamin B niacin and mm-hmm. it actually like puts your blood vessels out closer to the skin. Whoa. And yeah, they've done some cool studies on estrogen, especially fake estrogens like BPA and phthalates from plastics, these chemicals that act like estrogen. And when they test people's urine, there's hardly any BPA in there. You know, so you'd say, oh, those people that... Like they're bare, they're drinking out of plastic water bottles, but they're fine. They're not getting exposed. But they had those same people go in the sauna, and then they check their sweat, and it's full of BPA and phthalates. <laughs> so they're not peeing it out, but man, they're sweating it out like crazy. So it's a good just that reason alone is a phenomenal reason to use a sauna, get a sauna, get outside and sweat. Yeah. It's just the sweating, but the sauna is the cheat way to do it. It's the easy way to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, with guys and girls too, because obviously, mm-hmm. too much of that fake estrogen for girls, it's not terrible. Good. Yeah, too oh, much yeah. of that fake estrogen for guys is going to tank your testosterone. Yeah, tank our testosterone. So, like, what do we do about that? You avoid the chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> like the where are they? Because you know, because you you wrote a book on it, so you know, yeah, right. Like where all the all the nasties are. If I wanted to optimize my testosterone if i was a girl like you know had maybe some sort of estrogen my estrogen problems Mm -hmm. and we're thinking like okay in terms of like things that are essential to remove Mm -hmm. or to be aware of what what do you think is like the most important well i mean there's a lot of there are a lot and there's it's a problem in our culture Personal care products are probably one of the biggest sources because people get cheap personal care products. They're made, they're cheap because they're made from petroleum. And a lot of the petroleum byproducts act like estrogen in our body, like the phthalates and the parabens and all this. Um, and so personal care products, you got to be really careful. The other thing is you have to filter your drinking water. There's a lot of plastic pipes, a lot of plastic pollution, a lot of birth control in the water. They don't filter the stuff out at the municipal plants. Like the cities aren't filtering out all of those little chemicals and those hormones and those hormone mimicking chemicals. They're filtering out the, I mean, they're good at killing the viruses and bacteria. The water's safe, but it's not safe in the sense that like you're dosing estrogen when you're drinking unfiltered water. And a lot of people do. And what people, filter do I get real quickly? What, yeah. Before you continue, just what, activated what, charcoal. What bunch did I get? No, just okay. literally any of them. They're almost all have activated charcoal in them. Sometimes they call it carbon, like they call it a carbon filter, but that's just a misnomer. It actually has yeah. activated charcoal in it generally. So I could just go to Amazon, buy one, mm-hmm. install it. Yeah. It in. Sick. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have my preferences and whatnot on my website, but for the most part, just don't store your water in plastic either, because then you're just leaching in more, um, more of these fake estrogens. And that's the last thing we need in our culture. And by the way, like, you talked about men lowering testosterone for sure, but for women, um, if there's a chemical called atrazine, I don't know if it's legal in Australia or not, but it's it's totally it's the second most used herbicide in North America, so it's all over the place here in the U.S. And if you want to give animals polycystic ovarian syndrome, like P- PCOS, you give them atrazine, and you'll like get PCOS in those female mice or rats or rabbits or whatever. And it's all over our food. And it, what's really crazy about atrazine, it's in the drinking water in a lot of places where they spray it on the fields because it leaches through the soil into the into the water fount, into the water supply. And if you put, so first of all, uh, our estrogen, like for men, is usually about 20, let's just say, right? And for women, it's about 20 to 200, depending on the time of the month. So it's not that different. But if you put a, a male frog in atrazine water so pure water but you put a little bit of atrazine to make it 200 right you'll turn that male frog into a female all right (laughs) so obviously we don't want a lot of atrazine (laughs) but it gets worse because the legal allowable limit for atrazine in america in our drinking water is 3,000 nanograms per liter so it's literally like 10x what will to convert a male frog to a female and that's like 
that's the acceptable limit. They're st- they're saying like, oh, it's okay, your water's good. You know what I mean? Like they're giving it the thumbs up at three thousand. <laughs> so obviously filter the drinking water <laughs> and just watch out for pesticides and all that stuff. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's bad out there, you know. And if people want to get yeah. into the deeds of it, they should obviously read my book. But and it's pretty readable. It's digestible. It's on Audible. It's made for normal people, not scientists. You know, it's I wrote it in a way that was really easy to understand. Hopefully, I've never had people complain and say, "Oh, it's too scientific." If anything, people complain and say, "Like, it's not scientific enough. It's too," you know. But it's got 400 references to scientific. <laughs> but it's it's plenty substantiated. But you know what I mean, like. It's it's definitely not a technical treatise or anything. Yeah. But yeah, man. I mean, the personal care in the drinking water. If you want to hit the the biggest things, that those are it in terms of optimizing with your hormones and avoiding those chemicals. So, in terms of like, for me, because mm-hmm. phys- physique competitor, I want to get my testosterone up. Mm-hmm. First things, filter water. Be yeah. aware of self care products. What mm-hmm. else would you recommend? physique competitor so you're you actually compete yeah interesting good good for you my favorite hobby to do yeah yeah um i mean yeah i would go pretty extreme i mean like if you have do you have linoleum floors like a lot of flooring is plastic you know linoleum it's cheap to put that stuff in and that leaches up into the air they've done studies on baby mattresses that are made from vinyl you know which is plastic and even the mattresses leach enough into the air where it it's like a concern you know they say it's it's at the levels that can cause cancer and when you're at those levels it's like i mean it'll take 20 years to get to the cancer but you know what i mean like those levels will definitely be messing with your testosterone and your hormones um so yeah i mean if you're if you're really elite you know i would take it to the next level and look at you know all the details in my book instead of just like the major hitters like the water and the personal care products and again you can go really far in the weeds on that (laughs) as you can imagine right like plastics are freaking everywhere um you're never going to completely get them out but you can definitely do a lot to sweat them out you're going to get some exposures sweat those out you know not don't dose yourself constantly with new exposures you'll be fine um, I'm ass- obviously I'm assuming you're not doing soy products, right? <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I don't do soy products. The only the only soy that I do take is I take like a a 45 month fermented miso. Mm, good, good, good. Just for the for the probiotics, and I good. put them I put it in a bone broth. Very and good. And it makes the bone broth taste really good. And cool. I'm like, well, it's probiotics, and I get all the good stuff in the bone broth. And it tastes oh, good. Yes. Right on. Yeah, and it you tastes know, I like good. It. Yeah. Well, that's the key. If you ferment soy the fermentation breaks down the estrogen um the the canadians did a study uh over 100 plant foods they tested all these plants like broccoli and kale and on and on over 100 plants just looking at how much estrogen they have they call it phytoestrogen it means plant estrogen and uh virtually all all the plants are under 1000 units of estrogen most of them are in the hundreds maybe even 5 10 15 whatever but under a thousand, right? <clears throat> Soy is over one hundred thousand. So it's like a totally different ballpark in terms of how much estrogen it has. And so no soy milk like, lattes gone. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the soy milk, all that stuff. But if here's the crazy thing: if you ferment it, like if they ha- when they tested actual fermented soy sauce, it was under a hundred. Or maybe like so a normal. 50 or something. It's like super low. Yeah, super reasonable amount. Um, so almost non-existent in terms of how much estrogen is there. Because your gut bacteria breaks some of that down too. So if you flood the system and you take a, and you drink soy milk or something, yeah, you're, you're spiking your estrogen. And it's funny because no scientist disagrees with that. Like if you, if you say soy acts like estrogen to a to a scientist they'll be like of course it does like obviously but then you like say that out on youtube or something and people just like go berserk and it's it's kind of funny but <laughs> everybody agrees soy acts like estrogen i don't know why people get so like uh, argumentative about that topic um i write a lot about that in my book because you know there's supposedly a lot of debate about this but 
for sure it acts like estrogen. The question is, is it helpful estrogen? Is it harmful estrogen? What's it doing to your health? But most men recognize, look, I don't want to be spiking my estrogen, whether somebody tells me it's good for me or not. You know, you don't want to be boosting your estrogen levels. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Sunscreen what too, man. Sun, sunscreen too. I Ooh. want to throw in sunscreen really quick because yep. uh, a lot of people use sunscreen, people like myself that are super white. Um, and that's cool, but man, don't get the normal sunscreens that have these chemicals like oxybenzone and there's a couple of estrogen chemicals. Just get like pure zinc sunscreen with ingredients that you can read like coconut oil and things like that because sunscreen is super estrogenic. They did a study after I published my book actually on sunscreen and they did one application. It just put, put sunscreen on one time. Seven days later, it was still in people's blood above the government's own safety limit. This estrogen chemical, oxybenzone, and that's that estrogen. So, like, you're just absolutely smearing estrogen all over your skin. It goes through your skin, just like the personal care product stuff. And it's it's a big one because parents are giving it to their kids, and you know, a lot of guys are using it when they're going on. Just wear a sun shirt, put on a sun hat, use zinc sunscreen, something like that. Yeah, I ended up doing instead of sunscreen because I still, for me, like personally, when I wear sunscreen, I get to the sun, I'm still like, it's, it's still hot. Yeah. It still feels like it's cooking me in general. Mm-hmm. And I switched. And when I go somewhere like to, to like a beach holiday or something, I'll take a long sleeve shirt and a hat yep. somewhere. Yeah. And instead, I'll go like, I'll, I'll have some time um, in the sun with no shirt, enjoying the mm-hmm. beach and stuff. And then as soon as I start to feel, oh, I'm hot now, yep. I'll mm-hmm. put on a long sleeve and be like, I don't want to cook. Yep. This is so much better for me than having the, the, the sunscreen. That way I haven't worn sunscreen in it and it feels a lot better. So, so basically, yeah. just from my understanding, you're putting sunscreen on. This is how a lot of chemical work, a lot of different chemicals work, just in terms of even drinking water, touching plastics, being exposed to the fumes. Is like It'll get onto your skin, it seeps into your bloodstream, mm-hmm. then it goes through your organ, your brain, everywhere. then your body's got to detoxify it. Mm-hmm. And the way to get rid of that is to do things like sauna mm-hmm. and like, take certain supplements and antioxidants and make sure you're signaling the right genes to turn them on. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think some of the, like in in like your experience, what do you think are some of the best supplements that Mm. like have have really helped people? Oh man, it's too variable based on genetics. (laughs) Yeah. Like some people, they don't really need vitamin D. They just get out in the sun a little bit and they got great levels. Some people need a crazy dose. It's so variable, but, Everybody needs to do some supplementing, I feel like, in our modern culture. Um, well, what do you think of some some supplements that people may not know a lot about that you've been like, this one's actually been pretty handy that doesn't get yeah. talked about too often? Yeah, interesting. Um, well, uh, lion's mane we talked about before. I really, I, I mean, it's crazy the brain boost you get from lion's mane. Um, it's different than caffeine. I can't take it anywhere near evening because it amps my brain up so much. I can't sleep. My brain will just be busy going crazy. But it's different than caffeine, but I like it. It's it's really productive. Um, that's one. But it seems like people talk about that. I mean, I guess I don't have any that are super obscure. Um, like, you know, 5-HTP works for a lot of people. And tryptophan, could, those two together, because 5-HTP generally tells your body to make more serotonin in your gut it's a plant supplement but um it generally helps people sleep you know so you take it right before bed it kind of calms you down sometimes it doesn't some people it it it, it doesn't work but you know in people that it does work it it, it 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 tells your body make more serotonin but if you take it with tryptophan that's a building block for serotonin it's just tryptophan is just an amino acid it's just building block for protein but those two together are a good combo uh, iodine, a lot of people need iodine because they don't eat seafood ever and they're really not getting enough from salt. And then your thyroid hormones are made from iodine. That's a building block for thyroid hormones. So if you don't have enough iodine, you're definitely going to have low energy because you're not building, you know, thyroid hormones. Your body's like desperately scavenging it. In fact, sometimes I tell people to take iodine and then they send me an email and say, hey, I took iodine and I got like heart palpitations and it's bad. It's toxic. It's bad for me. And that's what happens. You get heart palpitations, like your heart beats weird. If you take too much thyroid hormone, like if you're natu- if you're overdosing thyroid hormone, you, you get a weird heartbeat problem. It's not good. I don't recommend anybody overdose thyroid hormones, but 
a lot of bodybuilders do in in america they compete in mr olympian stuff and a lot of them are my clients but um they get that same effect just from taking iodine and then they think iodine is bad but what's really happening is they've been so desperate for iodine for so long their body's just like been desperately scavenging every little tiny micron of it and then they throw in like they just flood their system with it one day because i told them to (laughs) and then their body like just makes tons of thyroid hormones and they get weird heartbeats so they're kind of overdosed like you want to ease into some of these things you know what i mean (laughs) if you if you're in a situation like that um but yeah man like i say it, it it's pretty variable and i'm never afraid of testosterone cream also i'm a big fan of replacing hormones including thyroid hormones but also testosterone i've seen people just transform their lives with that stuff too those are not really supplements they're prescription natural uh hormones but as we age our thyroid hormones go down everybody's and so like when you're 80 years old everybody should replace be replacing their thyroid It's stupid not to. Like, who doesn't want more energy? (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, no, thanks. I'll have less energy. I mean, I know people that, like, I go hunting in Montana with an 80-year-old guy. Literally, he, I mean, he replaces his testosterone and and his thyroid hormones. He takes thyroid hormones. And he's got so much energy. He's literally hard to keep up with in the mountains in Montana. (laughs) Right? And I also know 80-year-old guys in nursing homes that are literally too tired to wave their hand to, sit, to like to lift up their hand to wave high, and their thyroid so, levels are garbage, you know. And the doctors are saying, "Oh, that's okay. Though their thyroid is normal because everybody's declined with age, so everybody's garbage at that age." And they're saying, "Well, yeah, but that's normal, so they're okay. They're not dying because of it." But it's stupid because they kind of are dying in a certain way, <laughs> you know. Like it's just so sad. But um, so what what? What hormones or supplements do people use to increase their thyroid, to increase energy? Especially because I love the topic of anti-aging because obviously at Turnham Labs, we focus a lot on anti-aging. So I'd love to hear. Yeah. Well, I mean, iodine is, iodine is the biggie because if you don't have that, then you're definitely stuck. Tyrosine yeah. also is good because uh, tyrosine is an amino acid that is required to make thyroid hormones. Now, generally, you get that from meat and stuff. So if you're eating meat, you're getting tyrosine, but it'd be it's important to look at the numbers and make sure you're getting enough tyrosine, if you, especially if you have risks for uh, thyroid issues. Um, yeah, and some people have genetic issues converting T4 to T3, and it's, it gets kind of complicated. But yeah, for the most part, like I say, I'm not afraid of actual thyroid hormones because, number one, they're really cheap. They're, like, cheaper than a multivitamin. And number two, as we age, we just want to bump those levels up just the tiniest bit. You never want to, like, take a big thyroid pill and just you know (laughs) and just cross your fingers you always want to like cut the pill into like eight pieces even if a doctor prescribes it to you and says here this is the dose you should take i would still recommend cutting it into small pieces and easing into it iodine same thing but you know so you could like you can literally take t3 in a pill and just chop it up and oh yeah yeah crazy yeah generally i recommend something that's more full spectrum that has like all the thyroid hormones like armor thyroid is an example of that but Again, it depends on the person, you know, almost never do I recommend synthetic versions of thyroid that are patented, that the doctors are pushing on people. Um, yeah. But again, what about like depends. desiccated, can't you get, can't yeah, you get desiccated? Exactly. Yep, know? exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. armor. Yep. Yeah. There's a bunch of different versions, but yeah. Yeah, man. Which is, it's, yeah, nuts. Yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, the thyroid, like I said, yeah, the side effect, if you really do overdose it, is you mess up your heart. Nobody's trying to overdose. Like, if you're if you're out to overdose, if you're trying to overdose, like a bodybuilder or something, well, that's a different thing. Most people aren't doing that. You know what I mean? Like, so if you want more energy and you're aging, I see that as kind of an obvious low-hanging fruit situation, and testosterone is the same thing. It helps you recover faster. You know, you build muscle better, you have more energy, more sex drive, more metabolism. And for women, it's it's super important as well. And a lot of a lot of doctors pretend like it's not important for women, you know, but obviously for men, you know, everybody. Knows what else that. can you do? Yeah. What else could you do in terms of anti-aging? Anti-aging um, stem cells. My favorite is uh, hyperbaric oxygen right now because. Yeah, hyperbaric, they did a human study, not just like rats, but they did a human study where 
one 20 minute session they showed doubles your stem cell numbers. And that's key because, <laughs> yeah, dude. What? I know, I know nobody's talking. It didn't like make the news or anything because of all the stupid COVID stuff. But um, I think they got, if they did enough hyperbaric sessions where they got people up to eight times more stem cells. So you can just like massively juice on stem cells just by like sl taking a 20 minute nap in a hyperbaric chamber. You know what I mean? Wow. So, yeah. Man, that re I so much regret right now because there's been so many times where I've gone to the center to get into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber yeah. and instead gone, oh, but I want to go ca cryo because cryo is going to be really fun. Cryo is cool. Yeah. Um, cryo is cool. But next time, no cryo. I'm getting straight into hyperbaric and be like, yeah. yes, stem cells. Yeah. Recharge me for everything. Exactly. Some people even have genetic, they have genetic issues where they don't make as much stem cells with age. So then I, I tell them like, it's imperative. I mean, if you want to just stay healthy, you got to compete with everybody else, get those stem cells up. But yeah, man, that's, that's probably my big contribution in that regard, because I don't, I don't keep up that carefully on the supplements in terms of anti-aging, but I just keep up on the genetic issues. Like when people have that sirtuin gene, I tell them to take resveratrol or whatever, you know? Um, so it's pretty custom. Because obviously that sirtuin gene is like they, they don't activate the pathways as well as what mm -hmm. they should be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And so for people with that, it's really important to take those anti-aging supplements rather than the other people that it's not as important. Um, so it is, there's definitely a lot of variation there. And that's more my specialty than just just researching in general anti-aging <laughs> <laughs> yeah so true what else do you know about stem cells because i know you've done some research yeah they're super interesting i mean boy <laughs> i've given hour-long talks just on stem cells and it, you know usually my focus is like how do you increase stem cells because stem cells are good at homing so if you have a site of inflammation they'll home in on that. They can sense that based on the chemicals that are being secreted from that site and they'll home in and then they'll come in and dump different chemicals at that site that are reparative and restorative and fix the thing. And it's much better than, you know, like than anything else, honestly, because like, say you injure your knee. Yeah. You could take like a drug or something that might help to accelerate healing a little tiny bit, but the stem cells know a lot more, targeted ways to do that they'll secrete a hundred things or a thousand things at that site you know that probably all are acting much more powerfully than that one drug and now you've got a thousand things instead of one thing and so i love stem cells because because of that homing effect and the problem is if you don't get to an injury quick enough then you get scar tissue and then there's no more fresh inflammation and those chemicals aren't being secreted and then the stem cells don't do that much but if you get the quicker you can get at injuries with stem cells the better and and just so injecting them in there or injecting natural, natural it's all good and sunshine is a cheap way to get it naturally natural boost because sunshine is 40 percent infrared and infrared light does increase your stem cells so just get out in the sun you know we've been talking a lot about mm -hmm. that with that <laughs> yeah it is the main tip get out in the sun yeah. or, or get or get a juve and a vitamin Fast. d panel and don't get sunburned <laughs> yep, <right on. laughs> yeah, exactly. and if you're somewhere windy and cold and cloudy move to a different state <laughs> Wait, no and sometimes or at least hit the tanning bed or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah find someone with a tanning bed but yeah man hey. we live in a culture now where you know it's funny because i live in minnesota you know that's where the mayo clinic is and I've been here for four years now, but every time I go to Colorado or somewhere else, I'm always like, why in the hell do people live in Minnesota <laughs> where I live? Because there's no reason anymore. It's not like, I mean, I have my family here and my wife's family is here. So we get babysitting for the kids and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, I'm always questioning, like, why would anybody live in Seattle or somewhere it's rainy every day, you know, 300 days out of the year or something like that. Like we don't, we don't live in a culture where you need to do that anymore for the most part, but people still do it. I'm an example. <laughs> I do like the fishing and stuff around here though, you know? Yeah. Well, it still gets you out. It's kind of so fascinating to me because of what I've found in like uh, my own personal experience with injuries, which is what you're saying with the stem cells is mm -hmm. I'll just change up my routine and I'll just get back 
I'll just get back on my health grind, to be honest. I'll start saunering more, get in an ice bath, so get mm-hmm. regimented about those, mm-hmm. take the right vitamins. I take my shirt off when I'm walking in the sun and I always mm-hmm. get people walking past me. Aren't you cold? Or writing, oh, look at this guy with his shirt off. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I'm trying to get some vitamin D, guys. Come on. Yeah, um, yeah. And I do all of those things and next minute, like, my, my injuries sort of go and start mm-hmm. meditating. Yeah. Yeah, it's quick. Crazy. Yeah, the body's the best natural healer, but yeah, I agree, man. I'm the same way. I'm I'm always like walking around with my shirt off and you know, it's it's unfortunate that's not a cultural thing. And I think it comes from the medical system itself. They're telling people to get out of the sunshine and put on sunscreen and all this and there. And then they're telling you to eat breakfast. Like breakfast is the most important meal. That's another ridiculous thing that's it's just marketing. It's not even actual medical science based advice but that they're pretending like it is and they're parroting it there's so yeah. many things man like it's it's so obnoxious like people have to opt they have to look out for themselves you know in terms of their health if, if especially if you want to optimize i mean sure you can be miserable and zero energy and in the doctors will make sure that you're not going to die <laughs> based on your blood tests and all this kind of stuff but your blood sugar, don't trust the normal ranges. Vitamin D, don't trust the normal ranges. A C-reactive protein, your marker for chronic inflammation, don't trust the normal range. Testosterone, don't check, don't trust the damn normal ranges. All of these are disaster. Thyroid yeah. hormones, the thyroid normal range for TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, it's 0.5 to 5. That's the normal range. It's a tenfold difference. It's kind of like saying go jogging for one mile or ten miles, whatever. It's like such a ridiculous thing to say. <laughs> like, so people really just need to take matters into their own hands in terms of health optimization, because for yeah, sure so the modern of, system's not going to do it. Yeah, in, ter- so in terms of optimization in general, it's literally just like, well, one of the first things you could do is just become health conscious. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you have to of literally what, yeah, what's happening inside your body. That comes up to a question. So, mm-hmm. if I was, if I was someone who sort of started to have some success with myself, or I've been on a work grind for a while, or I've, I've gone through some periods in my lifetime where I start to think, man, I should really start investing in myself. What would you recommend them to start doing? It depends on people's goals and their, you know their age and i mean i always tell people to start with dna people email me this all the time and say like should i do this should i do that so well first thing i i pretty much make people do their dna first and i i have partners like one of my partners uh is a professional bodybuilder trainer he trains bodybuilders so like say a lot of my clients are professional bodybuilders so like one of my clients got second place in mr olympia you know because yeah because Every client that he has, he makes them do their DNA with me first to like is make Jake? sure. What's that? Is that is that Jake? Jake. Jake. Well, I don't Jake? know. No, no. <laughs> it was a few. It was a couple. Of years. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's the different categories, right? Okay. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, we, he all he makes them start with their DNA first, right? And then optimize from there, and um, you know. I do the same thing with professional athletes, MMA fighters, right? Like you always start with the DNA and it, and a lot of the other stuff varies based on people's goals, because obviously not everybody's a professional athlete. You know what I mean? So if you're in that camp, you're, you're going to have such a different approach and different goals than somebody who just wants to live a super long time or somebody who just wants to whatever, you know what I mean? Like there's so many different goals that people have. It's various. Well, let's, Let's put the scenario into someone who, let's say, isn't quite a professional athlete, mm-hmm. but they want to be sort of with themselves at an athlete level. Just because I know mm-hmm. a lot of my listeners are people from the age of like 20 to 30 or 20 mm-hmm. to 40. Yeah. And a lot of them are striving to be like the best. Right. Just, I like just it. Just in general. Yeah. So what would you recommend then? Yeah, I usually... Now, if you've got endurance genes, this is different and those are pretty rare, but most people are more fast twitch and they benefit more from like heavy lifting. My favorite, unless you're taking testosterone or steroids, I like the five by five routine. I'm a big fan of five sets of five reps for people that aren't 
super versed in the gym and they've never like built a foundation of strength because you can get into all kinds of like you know tricep this and you know <laughs> like whatever they're like lats that and quads this and hamstrings that but you want to be learning how to do the deadlift the squat the bench press the row the overhead press and the cable pull down those big i call them the big six big compound movements yeah and there's so many people man you go to the gym and you watch people and like 90 percent of people are setting themselves up for failure because number one they're doing all kinds of shenanigans but number two when people bench press and i'm sure you know this and whatnot but they'll have the they'll like start at the bottom of their the, you know at the bottom here with the bar and they'll their shoulders will get way out of joint they'll come yeah, way up roll. at the top yeah. yeah and that's so vulnerable for your shoulders so bad you want to keep your shoulders back the whole damn time so like this right mm-hmm. instead of like this but you yeah. see almost everybody bench pressing like that and the same thing with the row when you're pulling back you don't want to be like letting your shoulders go at the, at the top of the row you want to be yeah. keeping those shoulders back and rowing so that's position yeah. of strength on your shoulders And the same with your knees when you're squatting and deadlifting. If you're standing straight up, and I recommend people literally try this at home, stand straight up and try a squat. Just do one air squat, body weight, and just see what happens. But then now try a squat where you push your butt back as far as you can, and and then you break your knees, and then you bend your knees, right? Because most people naturally, when they squat, they'll bend their knees first, and their knees go way out ahead of their toes. And it's so bad for the knees. So then they try and develop like this foundation of strength and they end up screwing up their knees, wrecking their rotator cuff. And then they got to get for both of those things 20 years from now. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can't really like fully develop a foundation of strength if your knees are all jacked up 10 years from now and your shoulders are all screwed up. So you got to start on the right foot, which is those big compound movements, but you got to do the damn things right. Because if you do them correctly, you'll actually strengthen your shoulders. They'll be stronger. You'll strengthen your knees. They'll be more re- resilient and more robust. So, you know, five by five is awesome. If you're not taking steroids, that's such a damn good foundation of strength. Arnold Schwarzenegger used that back in the day before he was on steroids. And it's it, you got to, you know, work up really, really slow to the point where it's almost a joke. You know, t- like I would read Medi's report, M E D H I, if people have never heard of that. It's written kind of like an infomercial. So it's kind of over the top, but it's really good. It's really good information. He basically starts with an empty bar, and then you just add five pounds each time you go to the gym. So, like, not, not five, and this is not kilograms, but it's literally two and a half pounds to each side of the bar. Like, these little tiny weights to each side of the bar. And the next time you go in, a little, you know, but you're just progressing really, really slowly. And again, this is kind of for beginners, but some people, they they think they're pretty advanced, but they need to take a step back, start from the basics, start from the bar and work up and just give it six months. Because if you if you rush too fast, your joints can't keep up, the soft tissues get wrecked. Uh, that's my advice, I think, for people that want to really develop a strength. Yeah, well, I'd just like to acknowledge that you said, you know, obviously I said like, you know, what's the best, one of the best ways that you could start optimizing yourself and invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. And firstly, you said DNA. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing you said was in general, most people mm-hmm. have fast twitch fibers and to look after themselves, no matter if they're like an endurance runner or not, they should have some sort of resistance or strength training. I think that's yeah. so important because I recommend yeah. everyone, like unless they're, already at an elite mm-hmm. athletic point in their life where that's what they're doing, whether it's like soccer or running or something. And they're like elite in there. It's like, well, if you're not doing that, or even if you are doing that, you should still be doing some sort of resistance training yep. because yep. your DNA encourages it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love that so much. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. I've even had like professional baseball players and stuff. <laughs> Take a step back and start doing five by five with an empty bar because they've never really developed a foundation. I mean, yeah, they're amazing pitchers. They can throw a hundred miles an hour or whatever, but you want to be a little bit more holistic and more balanced. And, you know, you want to have that robust strength and that's where you start. You can always get more niche and, and more crazy once you develop that foundation. But for people that have never developed that, they got to go back and do it, you know? 
in my I love opinion. that so much. Don't what else besides strength? Besides strength training. Oh like man. <laughs> DNA, where should they sort of focus their attention first? I know it's very general because you get so specific, but yeah, man. Well, you know, I always struggled with get, getting bigger. You know, I was always like a small person in terms of like muscle mass, and it was always hard for me to put on muscle mass. I never struggled with obesity. I always struggled with getting big. And the real trick that I discovered was I had to eat a shit ton of calories. It was. It's like a job. You basically have to just like put down protein shakes like it's the end of the world. And th- that was a big discovery for me. Honestly, I see that a lot where guys are trying to get big and bulky and muscular. And number one, if you do that too fast, you'll literally start gaining fat. But, you know, number two, you really do have to eat a lot if you're wanting to get bigger, you know, and that can be hard if you're intermittent fasting. And I still recommend intermittent fasting. Um, but it depends on the goals, right? Like if you're an Olympian, you're not going to be in, you have to, you have to eat a lot more meals, you know, it's different. What about for like entrepreneurs or people that just really want to optimize their energy? Probably a meal, one meal a day, maybe even. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the person. It really does because some people, you know, it's, it's so variable. Again, it goes back to the DNA. The DNA always shapes like all of that stuff for me, but yeah, those meals, man, it stresses out your body. You know, like in, in the winter here in Minnesota, we've got a lot of ice and snow. And if you go out your front door, you see cracks on the sidewalk. After you eat food, you get cracks in your gut lining. You know, it's just stressful for your gut. What? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> well, well, if you're eating stuff that you're sensitive to, like yeah. if you're sensitive to dairy and you're doing a bunch of dairy, you'll get potholes in your sidewalk. You know what I mean? Like you'll literally get like holes in your gut lining. And that stuff takes time to heal. But if you're waking up early and you're pounding breakfast and then you're pounding a snack and then lunch and then another snack and then dinner and snack, 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 you never have time to heal. It's so stressful. But even if you're just doing like three meals a day, there's a little bit more stress on your gut. There's a little bit more time it takes to heal. That's sapping a little bit more energy. So oftentimes if you're trying to be a super high performer, either go one meal a day and make it big or go just do what I do because it works phenomenal for me. Skip breakfast, uh, zero carb lunch. It's key. Really works. And I'm not kidding. I'll just eat bacon for lunch or something. Just pure fat a lot. And most of the time, if I, depending on how, if I'm training really hard, that's different. I throw more protein, but you know, if I'm not training that hard, just pure fat, <laughs> get those ketones yeah. up. Ketones are rocket I say, fuel. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say even if you are like training really hard, because it depends on what, um, yeah, time you time you're training, because mm-hmm. you just re- replace does. your glycogen later on, like during the day, yeah. especially if you want to um, high perform. Because from my own knowledge is that that if let's say for example you train in the morning and you've got enough protein and fat throughout the day, is your your liver will start to make glycogen anyway, mm-hmm. um, out yeah. of out of that. So right. Oh yeah. Yeah, I do better. I mean, I lift better if I'm if I have more protein. Um, but again, I just go straight fat, so I'm kind of an outlier. Like, there's not a lot of people that are literally eating 100% fat for lunch, and that's it. <laughs> I'll drink like yeah, heavy for lunch whipping today. cream, butter. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much, man. No, seriously, I'll do like heavy whipping cream. Like, I'll just have a glass of heavy whipping cream and carry on or something. But again, it works. I mean, it depends. For me, it depends a lot on how much brain performance i want if i really have a busy day where it's just like i've got to have my brain at a real high functioning level then i'm i'm more specific about that i'm more emphatic about it um and what does that look like oh like like just a couple days ago i had six dna consults in in the same day you know what i mean like and four of them were from australia by the way hey but that's literally me talking for 90 minutes at pop, you know, because I do 90 minute consults. So that's six times 90 minutes of me talking so nonstop. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I had other stuff going on too. It wasn't like that's my day. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, those are the kind of, de- maybe I'll just do one meal a day on those days. I won't even do fats. You know, I won't slow my metabolism. I won't like stress my system at all. Maybe I'll just completely skip food that day. i you know, it varies, right? But throw some lion's mane in there, 
again, I don't you don't use it all the time. I just use it as a tool. Caffeine, same. I try and stay not addicted to caffeine, and that, that way I can use it as a tool instead of, uh, you know, instead of being numb to it. You know what I mean? So, like, if I was drinking five cups of coffee every single day, I'd be pretty numb to it. It probably wouldn't do much for me. But, like, say, you know, I've got to do a 24-hour drive or something. Like, I do I do sometimes do some long drives. I don't usually 24, but, you know, just as an example, if I was driving all night long in my car, um, then I throw down some coffee, and it's like, boom! <laughs> it suddenly works. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way I want I love- it to be, you know what I mean? Yeah, I just love how you said straight away, just then how you said, I don't want to be addicted to caffeine. And I don't think there's a lot of people out there that don't even realize that like, caffeine is addicted and it's, it's very... It's like, crazy. It doesn't yeah. take much time before you're addicted to it. And I've like battled that recently. I remember it was because I started a, a competition prep. Mm-hmm. And I come into the competition prep. When I started, I was like, I'm not drinking caffeine and this is going to be so hard yeah. for a week yep. because I've been having a coffee every single day and now I'm just cutting it and I'll have a, yep. a few decafs instead. Um, and then when I need to do a brain performance, instead of having coffee for me, I'll have like a, a small amount of nicotine. I find that's mm. like a little yep. bit better, like Same. a real small, small amount. Instead. Yeah. Yeah. Same man. I yeah. do. I actually smoke cigars occasionally. I even grow my own tobacco. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. So uh, like, it sounds like I'm a, like a super a, a nicotine addict because I, I, I was going to say I just smoked scar last night, but I generally, it's like once a week or less, you know what I mean? But, but I, I use it the same way. I use it as a nootropic, but I also like smoking a cigar. So generally I time it. So like when I did my PhD thesis, no joke, you know, I spent five years doing a PhD at Boston University Medical School. And then when I actually defended my thesis, which is like a five hour ordeal, you know, like of talking to professors and giving a public speech and getting grilled and all this. I smoked a freaking cigar before I went in there and, you know, it went a long way. (laughs) So it's another tool. Yeah, man. What other tools have you got that you like to use? Oh, man. I don't, well, right now it's 1 a.m., so I'm losing my tools. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't really have that many. I mean, I use green tea because it's a little less crazy than coffee sometimes. Gosh, what, what else? I mean, so many things. I have, I literally have like a plastic tub of supplements. I do a lot of tinkering. I mean, specific to the brain, I don't really do much else. Um, and as soon as I say that, I'm like, hmm, do I? But I use magnesium very regularly to calm myself down. Because more, I have more of an issue just calming down than amping up. So like uh, before I'm bed, I yeah, I take magnesium before bed pretty religiously. Um, gosh, yeah. What, what about currently? Just stuff that you just, at the moment that you've just started tinkering with? Yeah, I mean, today, like, I like soda, you know, and I don't drink it. So, I, I mean, every once in a while I'll cheat or something, but I, I also don't like aluminum cans because they have plastic lining. So, what I what I did today, just as an, as a, as an example, um, I used one of those CO2 infusers. I have one of those, you push the button, it shoots some CO2 in your water, and I have cold water in the fridge in a glass thing specifically for this. And then I put some tangerine essential oil in there and a little bit of stevia, and it's amazing. Um, and my kids had some too, and you know, <laughs> yeah, because sometimes tangerine I just crave essential oil. Oh, that's, it was, great. that's my favorite, yeah. And I threw a little Whoa. key lime juice in there too, just to make it like a little sour. So I love that, just little things like that, you know. I mean, and most of that stuff is on my website. Um, yeah, if people want to look at a lot of the different things that I've compiled because again, I am getting pretty tired. <laughs> yeah, you are. I was going to say, I'll let you go. So just before, <laughs> cause you was one I have, I'll let you go now. Just before like you go for the podcast, just where can people find you and where can they find all your resources if they're interested in well, yeah, having yeah. a look? So my book is on Amazon. It's called Estro Generation, Estro Generation. And my website has a terrible name. It's called ajconsultingcompany.com. <laughs> It's not original, it's not novel, but it's but it's I, what I came up with like 12 years ago and yeah. I'm stuck with it. But ajconsultingcompany.com is where I have a lot of my, you know, just basically everything, to be honest. So, And I'm on YouTube, too. If you look up my name on YouTube, I have more of like an out, 
it's kind of sciencey, but also outdoors stuff I've been putting out recently where I go hunting and fishing and sometimes I rant about COVID or something else on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's called Anthony J. Cast. So that's a newer thing for me, but, uh, but yeah, those three things, Amazon, AJ Consulting Company dot com and, and Anthony cool. J. Cast. Yeah, man. And I'll, I'll, for everyone listening, I'll link those all in the script and the subscription in the <laughs> the, I'll, I'll link them the all in the uh, description in the description there we go it's not what i am here yeah. i'll link them in the description you got you messed so up with my youtube thing accent. talking about subscriptions <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think so that's where the brain yeah. kind of got confused there so uh anthony thank you so much for coming on thank yeah, you for coming on at the time that you had yeah, man, um nice. especially because i know that it's so late and thank you for sharing like your wisdom and your knowledge like I honestly like cherish it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Thanks, all the stuff Appreciate that you've, it. you've been doing and what you've been learning and how you've been distilling it. And I just love how, how you've been recommending like on the podcast, if anyone's been listening, all the things that Anthony has been mentioning for me, what has clicked in my mind, I'm hoping you guys as listeners got this is just like, it's all so simple and it's all just like getting conscious and taking responsibility for all the basics, just your health, your sleep and all the et cetera stuff. And one way to cut above all of that and like sort of cut all the garbage away is to just get a DNA test. <laughs> yeah, you can see it all there. So yeah. I hope if anyone's listening, there's some absolute um, nuggets there. So thanks. Anthony, thank you Appreciate so much for coming on and sharing all that. Yeah, man. Thanks. Anytime. Take care. All right. Good. See ya. Yeah. Bye.